meeting. Uh, uh, I don't know whether this is because Professor Blackshear's <coughs> uh, lunches are a little longer than usual this quarter, but uh, we'll, we'll be starting from 3.35 from now on. Uh, the questions related to ethics are being raised in a number of arenas today in, in education. Uh, we see this in the uh, proposal for the uh, liberal education at the University of Minnesota, where there are strong recommendations for courses in ethics. We see this in the requirements of the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, where there's a strong uh, push for engineering ethics courses for engineers. And it's fine to uh, do this in what we sometimes call an academic manner in terms of reading about ethical problems and ethical issues and, and decisions made on ethics and either from a textbook or from a faculty member. But today we'll have a, a living example of, of an issue in engineering ethics and the person that played a, a key role in, 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 a, in a very important manner. It's been said that uh, engineering advances often as a result of failures, that we learn from the analysis of, of <coughs> failures of systems what one might do in the future and what one must do in the future. And, and that's fine, and, and, and there's a certain uh, more than grain of truth to that perhaps, but one thing is to learn from failures that one could not predict before the failure occurred. It's another thing when people were predicting a particular failure and then it occurs. And, and that latter issue is the one which we'll hear about today. And it's truly a, an ethical issue which will go down in the history of engineering and the history of the U.S. The failure that led to the disaster of the, um, of the Space Shuttle Challenger is one that was well known to, to ev everybody uh, here today. It's an issue that raised problems related to engineering decisions versus what were called to some extent management decisions, it brings rise to questions of the need for having technical leadership uh, at the proper levels in industry and that technical leadership making decisions on technical grounds as well. Uh, the speaker today is one who has been called, with uh, good reason, a, a, a whistleblower and uh, has suffered all of the, the bad as well as some of the good that occurs to whistleblowers, uh, as, as you'll hear about today. I think uh, it's a rare opportunity for us to hear uh, firsthand about a key issues related not only to what has become a very tragic incident, but also key issues related to what engineers must do and consider when practicing in industry. Roger Beaujolais is a graduate of what is now the University of Lowell. He received an engineering degree there in 1960. He worked for a number of uh, companies uh, generally related to aerospace industry. Uh, from uh, July 1980, he started to work for Morton Thiokold in Utah. He worked there through, of course, the incident on the Challenger, which was in January 86, and left uh, the company later on in, in 1986. Uh, he's been giving lectures at some other educational institutions. I heard him a few years ago speak at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers meeting. I'm sure you'll all be impressed with uh, the knowledge he'll impart today and the sincerity in which he'll deliver. Mr. Beaujolais. The light didn't come on. Light box off. Light box is off. No. There we go. Okay. Good afternoon. What I'm going to do is define to you the circumstances leading to the challenge of disaster and give you a factual chronology of what happened uh, that led to the decision-making process. Before I start, I'd like to give you somewhat of a uh, familiar familiarization process here. What we're looking at here is the, what we call the stack on the shuttle, the solid rocket boosters, the external tank, and the orbiter itself. And I'm going to be primarily focusing on the solid rocket booster phase. The booster is actually made up of four segments that are transported to Cape Canaveral and assembled ready for launch. We're looking at the forward section, forward center, the aft center, and the aft section containing the nozzle itself. <coughs> 
The reason I show you this is because I want to point out a full booster and show you this is the joint that failed, and this is the configuration of that particular joint. And I have a full-size set of uh, uh, pictures of that in a moment. Another joint that I will be discussing as part of the escalation of the problem is this nozzle joint that looks like so. And again, I have a full-size graph of that that I want to show you. What really started uh, with, my, with the concerns was the fact that when we assemble this, this field joint, you can see we have vacuum putty located between the two interfaces on either side of this joint. The joint is configured with a clevis and a tang. The tang fits into the clevis with two O-rings. We refer to the first O-ring that the hot gas had the potential of reaching through this path right here as the primary O-ring seal. And then the redundant secondary seal behind it was the flight rate man rating of this vehicle, basically. This was our backup seal should anything ever occur and hot gas get past this primary seal. Now, the gas that this system was to protect against was approximately 5,700 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was never intended to have any holes in this putty. It was never intended for this gas to ever come down and penetrate and even reach a seal. But unfortunately, the mechanism of assembly caused entrapped air to occur, and occasionally, and quite frequently, in fact, we'd get uh, blowholes in this putty, which would then provide a path during ignition for the hot gas to come down and attack the O-ring seals. Uh, just to show you, well, I guess not, not in more vivid detail. I had a full-scale model here, but I, I think <laughs> I'll forego that. The joints were actually uh, put together, like I said, tang and clevis, and pinned in 177 locations. These pins, one-inch diameter, actually carried the structural load as the internal pressure was generated. As you can <laughs> see here, th this is a propellant outline, and there's a, actually a hole down the center line of the motor, so large, in fact, that you could actually stoop down and walk down the full length of this motor. These components were 12 foot in diameter and contained 1.1 million pounds of propellant when they were fully assembled ready for flight at the Cape. The problem really started to escalate in January of 1985. In January of 1985, I was at the Cape and when the boosters were recovered for reuse and refurbishment uh, and disassembled at the Cape, I inspected them and I found two field joints of the character that I just showed you, had massive leaks in them. We had compromised the primary seal in two field joints. In fact, they were compromised so bad that in one joint, we actually had 80 degrees of blackened grease between these two seals, which indicated the products of combustion had actually blown by this first primary seal and fortunately were actually stopped by the secondary seal. One joint had 80 degrees arc length and the other joint had 110 degrees arc length. It was postulated after this launch that these seals had a temperature of 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in, by March, early, late March, uh, late February, early March of 1985, I had brought this information back and one of my colleagues, a former supervisor in fact, had devised what we referred to as a resiliency test to actually test the capability of these seals to perform in an environment that we had not previously tested for, namely a lower than normal launch temperature. We found out through these preliminary O-ring resiliency tests that we were in severe problem area at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the seals had a distinct problem with them at that temperature. We presented this information to engineering management at Thiac Hall, but they felt it was just too sensitive to release to anybody, and so they just kept it secret. The only people that really knew about it was the individuals who had actually worked and knew about the test and, and were privy to the results. Well, and I will, I will give you this data later on in the presentation so you know precisely what the data encompassed. In June of 1985, the problem escalated once again. We opened up a, 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 a nozzle joint this time, and the nozzle joint is made up of a joint that looks like so. This is a, what we call the nozzle fixed housing, and the nozzle cone actually lays across the exit like so. And so what we have here is a piece of metal that supports the gimbaled nozzle that actually is attached to the aft closure dome. And the metal parts are heavily insulated because of the turbulence of the gas in this area. And again, we find a gap between the insulation, which was filled with vacuum putty. Again, the primary seal would be in this location, the first seal 
designated as the primary is the, is the seal that would first be attacked by hot gas should it ever occur. Now, in this joint, we have a different characteristic in that we have a very, very safe secondary seal, which is a face seal around the corner. It's actually squeezed between two massive pieces of metal. This represents almost the full-scale uh, cross-section of what we're looking at. We have 100 one and an eighth inch diameter bolts that actually clamp this face together. Now, what I'm about to show you when we, is what we found when we opened up this joint in June of 1985 from an actual flight that occurred in April. This particular segment was actually sent back to Thiokol in Utah with the nozzle intact on this particular assembly, and we disassembled it at Utah because it was much easier to do it that way back at our plant. Now, what I'm about to show you is the condition of the seal that actually came out of that joint. And I'd like to point out to people that this is not a cartoon. This is an actual photographic cross-sections of the seal that were removed from that joint. And as you can see, the seal had three heat-affected notches in it from the hot gas. Each of these cross-sections refers to a notch as shown in the plan view. Now, what we're looking at, a side view, what we're looking at here is this highlighted, the dark highlighted outline is the amount of seal material that remained as opposed to the round circular cross-section that should have been there. And if you look at this worst cross-section, I would estimate that somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of the cross-section has been vaporized by the hot gas. We postulated that this cross-section and this seal had never sealed for the full two minutes of booster flight. And so we really had a brand new ball game here because if whatever happened to this joint, and we come up with several postulations as to what it might have been, but after all, we don't have crystal balls. But whatever happened to this joint, if it should happen to a field joint, then all bets are off because the field joint might fail because both of those seals are bore seals on the same surface, and it's not difficult to predict that whatever happened to one could happen to the next one in line. Now, at the same time this was going on in this joint, the sec secondary seal around the corner, that very safe seal that I spoke to you about, was also eroded 32 thousandths of an inch. And so we really had a, a new problem on our hands and another miss, a near miss. Well, this was so serious that for the next flight right in this review, we had to go down and present a, a complete status of all the booster seals on the shuttle program to NASA at the Marshall Space Flight Center. So we did this, and because of the seriousness of this, what we just found on this seal, it was decided by engineering management that they would now release the information that they had been keeping secret up to this time. And they presented that information to NASA, and now everybody on the program knew about the seriousness of the seals and their uh, serious functional capabilities at 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Actually, at 50, because that was the low limit that we tested. Well... As you can imagine, I waited for some action to take place, and I waited two full weeks, and virtually nothing was done. They had formed an unofficial task force team, but virtually nothing was being done. After two weeks of frustration with this activity, I wrote a memo on the 31st of July, 1985, <coughs> to the Vice President of Engineering at Morton Thiokol, and I'd like to give you a sense of that memo, and quote one paragraph. The memo ended by saying, quote, it is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem with the field joints having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with all the launch pad facilities. I also mentioned in that memo that we were going to experience a failure of the highest order, loss of human life. On August 15th, a SEAL task force team was officially formed I believe is a direct result of that memo. Although no one ever talked to me about that memo, the Vice President of Engineering never wrote me a memo back or never talked to me about the contents of that memo. But he published a memo officially forming this team, which had five of us designated as full-time members out of approximately 2,500 people working on the program, not all of whom were engineers, of course. Unfortunately for us that were assigned to this team, we received virtually no management support whatsoever. The major production program dominated all available resources as we struggled to uh, get changes uh, tested and implemented in the program itself. Well, on August 19th, NASA headquarters was getting a little antsy, so they asked for a presentation from Morton Thiokol again on the status of the booster seals on the shuttle program. And NASA management was assured by Thiokol senior people 
that it was safe to continue flying. Well, January 27th was the concluding major event that was uh, in front of us prior to the challenge of disaster. On that day, we got a rather benign telephone call asking if we were concerned about the predicted overnight temperature low of 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, being the only technical person that had seen the joints disassembled the year before, I about went into orbit without any booster assist at all. And very, very concerned, along with my colleagues, we mustered up a group of engineers that were extremely concerned with what we were faced with. We convinced Thiokol Engineering Management and also the business side of the house, I might add, that day that it was not safe to launch under these conditions based on our previous year's experience and the experience during the year and the escalation of the problem. We were asked by, and we transmitted this informally to the Marshall Space Flight Center, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. We were asked to give a formal presentation that evening to express our concerns. So a formal telecon was convened. And we were at Morton Fire Call in Utah, where we were uh, gathered. There were 14 of us. There were a group at the Kennedy Space Center, and then there was a group at the Marshall Space Flight Center, which was the technical branch that had oversight for the shuttle solid rocket boosters. We started our presentation, and what I'd like to show you is a sampling of the view graphs that we presented that night. And I like to point out to people that we had precisely about 45 minutes to present, prepare this formal presentation. And we as individuals went to our own offices and prepared, prepared these view graphs. And none of us knew what the other people were presenting, except we saw it in real time. But I hope that you understand after you see them that what we presented was enough information from an engineering standpoint to stop the flight. What this was was a, a sheet and a cartoon that I had torn right out of an October 85 presentation to SAE that I gave to 130 technical experts in this nation concerning the SEALs in this joint and how they operated as I solicited help from their expert opinions. So I had this at my fingertips. So I included this. I thought this would be another neat way to drive the point home once again what the problem was. If you look at this top view with this center line of the segment being here relative to this piece here, you'll find that everything is as it should be when it's assembled. You see how the O-rings are touching both sides of the surfaces? That's how O-rings are really supposed to work. But you'll find in, in the pressurized view down below with the same criteria, this is the center line relative to this view, that as pressure is applied to this cylinder and the walls actually bulge out radially, the joint doesn't deflect quite as far because it has a larger stiffness. Well, the effect of that differential deflection is to cause this inboard clevis leg to deflect in towards the center line of the motor at the same time that the tang is deflecting outboard with the resulting effect that this gap opens tremendously on the order of 42 to 60 thousandths of an inch. The 42 thousandths of an inch is a measured maximum number conducted in 12 tests with hydraulic oil as we had measured over the period of time. This is my best estimate of 60 thousandths, which may be a practical upper limit since we had only run 12 tests and I wasn't about to stand up and say that we had screened out the maximum at that point in time. And so this was my best estimate. Now when I presented this to SEAL experts in San Diego at SAE, nobody said a word. And I know why they didn't say a word, because these are more than an order of magnitude beyond the accepted industrial standards for the uses of O-ring design. These should be on the order of a thousandth to two thousandths of an inch. And we're talking 42 to 60 thousandths of an inch in a pressurized condition with an O-ring of that size. Now, the problem is exacerbated even further because you'll see that the secondary O-ring is lifted off its, its seal seat. That's the problem with this joint. When the joint opens that much, this small diameter seal with, with the 20 thousandths minimum squeeze on it does not have the margin to allow it to stay seated on its mating surface. And so this is a misapplication of O-ring technology. And if you want to look at what happened to Challenger, just picture both O-ring seals looking like the secondary seal position. Both O-rings were lifted off and hot gas went roaring by, eating the seals that were lifted off alive as it went out the case. Continued to slow leak until it reached about 50 seconds. Then it started to flow more rapidly. And the trace on the pressure transducer at the head end showed the, the, the pressure drop falling at the same time the hole was growing. At 73 seconds, the hole was analytically predicted to be about 25 inches in diameter. When they found the pieces, it was about 25 inches in diameter. I had also taken this right out of the August 19th presentation, the 
NASA headquarters. I had prepared this chart for that presentation, although I didn't present it at that time. <clears throat> you can see way back in August, my primary concern was with the field joints that had the highest concern. The erosion penetration of the primary seal requires a reliable secondary seal for pressure integrity. And I've broken it down into two conditions, ignition, transient, and steady state. In the zero to 600 millisecond region is the time it takes to go from zero pressure to 1,004 PSI. Broke that down into three regimes, zero to 170 milliseconds, we have a high probability of having a secondary seal. In other words, the secondary seal will be contacting like the primary seal because we have really not experienced any joint rotation yet because nothing is really happening. It's just starting to be pressurized. In the 170 to 330 millisecond region, we have somewhat a reduced probability because now motion is, is starting. And in 330 to 600, we have a high probability that we might not have secondary seal capability. Now, how did we know this? Well, we had done bench testing that actually showed us this, and bench testing also showed us that the initial phase of 100, 0 to 170 milliseconds was safe. And if we should ever penetrate the seal, primary seal, after the, the initial ignition transient, we had a high probability that we would have no secondary seal capability because it would be lifted off. And so what we were talking about here is timing function. You'll, f you'll find this re referred to later on as timing function. And this was nothing new. They had seen this before, but this was just kind of reinforce what we had already presented to them. What this chart was, was a chart made up, and you see it's hand printed. We didn't have the time to get it typed up. I just hand printed this, so you'll have to excuse some of the, the words, and you can see I just stuck things in as, as, as appropriate. I did this specifically for Challenger. That other chart had nothing to do with Challenger. That was a general chart on the program itself. And you'll notice that I had no mention of temperature in the other chart. I was afraid of these joints even at room temperature in the middle of summer because that joint was simply a lousy design. A temperature lower than the current database results in changing the primary O-ring sealing timing function. Those are the three zones that I described previously. That was my fear, that we'd slide from that first safe zone to one of those two uh, other zones and, heaven forbid, the last zone nearing uh, 330 milliseconds. This is the January 85 launch designated as the 15th flight where we had 80 and 110 degrees of arc length of black and grease. Lower O-ring squeeze would, result in, uh, would be the result of lower temperature. I'd actually run a calculation that day which showed the cross-section of the O-ring to shrink by one thousandth of an inch. Not very much, but we didn't have very much to spare and it's in the wrong direction. Higher O-ring shore hardness. That material gets just like a brick when it freezes. We were just slightly above the glass transition temperature, which is defined as the temperature of an elastomer at which all the little spaces disappear and it is now like a piece of metal. Thicker grease viscosity, not the best wording in the world, but what I'm referring to is the slipperiness or the quality of the grease to allow the O-ring to slide into position. It would impede that somewhat. Higher O-ring pressure actuation time is a result of lower temperature than we had experienced previously. Now, the bottom two bullets sum up the whole uh, discussion that evening and the whole fear. If the actuation time increases, the threshold of secondary seal pressurization capability is approached. That was what we were really afraid of. If the threshold is reached, then it's really a jump ball. We might not be able to seal these joints. We were not talking about these joints sealing once the seals uh, are sealing and working and being attacked by hot gas. We were talking that night about them even functioning as being able to function as seals before the hot gas ate them alive. This is the infamous data that we obtained in the February-March time frame in 1985. And as you can see by the data, when we ran these tests, now let me first explain what we actually did. We actually took an O-ring between two steel plates. And, and we squeezed down two, two steel plates to actually represent this action right here on the, on the actual joint. And what we were doing is squeezing it down, squeezing an O-ring down. Let me just actually make it perfectly clear by putting an O-ring seal in there. We're actually squeezing the O-ring down 40 thousandths of an inch and then removing 30 thousandths of that squeeze so we should have had a residual squeeze of ten thousandths of an inch. And measuring, in, you know, by optical means and light means whether or not 
the O-ring still maintain contact with both metal parts. Well, we did that at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and we found that at 100 degrees, the O-ring maintained contact with the metal parts. We did it at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and we found that it separated for 2.4 seconds. And at 50 degrees, the same test produced the results of separation for an excess of 10 minutes. We stopped measuring after 10 minutes because it was ridiculous to, to proceed with, with further measurement because 10 minutes and 2.4 seconds compare to 200 milliseconds. Actually, I, I designate it as 170 milliseconds. Now, that 170 milliseconds was my best estimate. Post-disaster testing was literally thousands of tests pointed to the real number being 200 milliseconds. So I missed it by a few ticks. You can see that this also was a, a unconservative test, but we had fixed machine settings at the time, and this was only a preliminary set of data. We actually separated at 2 inches a minute, and the flight rate was 3.2 in inches per minute. So this was slightly unconservative. But I, I point to this and tell everybody that's in engineering, I only need one piece of negative data to shut something down. I can't necessarily say the same thing to go forward with a project, but I only need one negative piece of data to shut something down. That was a very bad piece of data to continue going forward with this program. And yet, and, and this is the data we presented and had in our possession that evening. And I was asked during the course of the telephone conversation to produce other data. And out of sheer frustration from being badgered, I, I basically blurted out that I'm sorry, I don't have anything other than what I presented because I've been trying to get other data since last October and the, and the system just would not allow me to get it. And when I said that, the general manager of our plant just about come out of his chair. The conclusions in the next chart, the recommendations chart, were actually written and presented by the vice president of engineering at Morton Thiokol based on our input up to, up to the meeting time. The temperature of the O-ring is not the only parameter controlling blow-by. Well, absolutely. That's a given statement because we had blow-by at various temperatures. But the characteristic of the blow-by is the important thing to understand. The January flight had blow by with an O-ring temperature at about 53 degrees. We had four development motors with no blow by in the range of 47 to 52 degrees, but there's a caveat to that right away. The development motors had putty packing, which resulted in better performance. Now, let me explain that to you. They're tested in a horizontal position, and it's a very difficult assembly. And so when they were assembled and they walked down the joint after assembly and looked at the putty and the character of the joint from the inside, they found that there were like little volcanoes, volcanoes in the putty, holes. And they attributed that to the very difficult and severe assembly in a horizontal position. And so they just slammed them shut with the handle of a broom, for instance, or shoved some more putty in and tapped it shut. So they didn't really represent what they had in flight. But they, and it was okay. Their rationale was okay up to that point. But they should have investigated the flip side of that coin, which was, does it do the same thing when we assemble it vertically? Because they're assembled vertically at the cape. Now... When they finally got around to doing that, it was in the middle part of 1985, middle to latter part of 1985. What do you think they found? They found that when they assembled it vertically, it also blew holes in the putty. So by not doing those tests early on in the program, they essentially voided the development qualification testing relative to O-ring erosion due to hot gas impingement. So we really couldn't use that data that night, even though it was stated. At about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we expect blow-by to occur. It's a reasonable assumption. We had it at 53 the year before, well within experience base. We expect the temperature to be 29 degrees at 9 a.m. and 38 degrees at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for launch time. Those were options that we were considering that night. We have no data other than temperature that would make these joints any different than anything else we have ever flown. In fact, from a geometry standpoint, we presented that that evening, but to keep it somewhat in hand here, I don't present it anymore, we had geometry joints that had better O-ring squeeze on them than most of the joints we had previously flown. So we had a better set of joints from a geometry standpoint. The recommendations basically state, don't fly it. And if you have to fly it, for heaven's sakes, back out the conditions of ambient temperature and wind to produce a sealed temperature of no lower than 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And that basically was the end of our presentation. It lasted about an hour as questions were batted back and forth and, and discussion at times got very heated. So we sat down, and now it was management's turn. Our manager was asked by the project manager at the Kennedy Space Center, who was actually a Marshall Space Flight Center in, uh, type, uh, 
for his launch decision. And our project manager responded that he did not recommend launching based on the engineering presentation just made. <clears throat> now pay attention. That's the first no vote. Many of you probably don't even know that the original decision was made not to launch, but it was. And so that dispels all this garbage about we were too technical in our presentation and the managers didn't understand. They understand fully. They understood fully. The original decision was made not to launch. Then Larry Malloy, who was the man asking the questions, asked his, essentially his chief engineer at the Marshall Space Flight Center for his launch decision. Okay, George Hardy responded that he did not, he was appalled at Thiokol's recommendation, but he would not recommend launching over the contractor's objection. That's the second no vote. Then Larry Malloy, who was the man asking the questions, went into a summary mode, and that's when he made some of his famous comments about, when do you want me to launch Thiokol next April? And this, remember, this was January, and they had a very aggressive launch schedule. That was, George Hardy's statement about being appalled was the start of the pressure. I know it because I felt it. George Hardy was a highly respected individual in the program and had worked for NASA for many, many years. And when George Hardy says he's appalled, I'll tell you, he damn well gets the attention of everybody listening. And I felt the pressure, and I felt the pressure about the comments from Larry Malloy. And I was very, very nervous about it. He concluded with a statement that he it was his opinion that the data we presented was inconclusive. Now think about that statement for a moment. We're at this meeting, flight readiness review meeting, to prove that it's safe to launch. His statement about our data being inconclusive actually violates NASA's long-standing uh, conditions of forcing contractors and themselves to prove that it's safe to launch. His statement about the data being inconclusive is actually an automatic default to a no-launch condition, if you think about it. So that's three no votes including the man asking the questions. As soon as he gets finished speaking, our program manager asks for a five-minute offline caucus to reevaluate the data. Now, it's the caucus that actually constitutes the unethical decision-making forum, in my opinion, because if they had done nothing except hang up the phone, they'd have been in great shape. They claim to the Presidential Commission, our managers claim that they felt no pressure at all, but I submit to you, if they didn't feel any pressure, why did they ask for the caucus? The decision had already been made not to launch. So I know they felt the pressure because I felt the pressure and I was there. They started to have a meeting amongst themselves because the first word spoken when the mute but a button was pushed on mute was spoken by our general manager. He said in a soft voice, we have to make a management decision. And I emphasized soft voice because he wasn't speaking to me. He wasn't speaking to my colleagues down the other end of the table. I was less than five feet away from them, so I heard, I heard every word spoken. He was speaking to his other three senior executives who were all vice presidents, three of which were gathered right around the table, one of which was sitting up against the, the wall. Never did participate. The man against the wall never did participate in anything except shook his head yes that he was going to launch in the ultimate decision. Anyways, they were trying and struggling, trying to make a list on a piece of paper that would justify a decision to launch. When my colleague Arnie Thompson came from way down the other end of the table, up, placed a pad of paper down, and once again sketched out the joint with the explanation verbally why we should not attempt the launch under such adverse conditions. Arnie was summarily ignored. Got the vilest looks you can ever, ever, ever imagine. He went back to his place because he had n no way of getting them engaged in conversation with him. When he gave up and went back to his seat, I grabbed 8 by 10 color glossy photographs that showed the 1985 launch and the hot gas blow by and the blackened condition between the seals. I also had a comparative photograph of a room temperature launch which showed the same type of blow by but with a totally different characteristic. It was gray, sort of mottling and splotchy in characteristic and it was like night and day between the two. All you had to do to say to anybody, a person on the street, was that the color black is bad and tells you that you're in worse shape. Now, which pick, pick one that's in worse shape, and 100 times out of 100 times, they could pick the right photograph. When I made that pitch to our managers, they just did not want to hear it. They didn't want to look at the photographs. They didn't want me to talk to them. They just summarily ignored me also. I was told by my colleagues after the meeting that I was literally screaming at the managers to look at the photographs and not ignore what they were telling them, namely that more hot gas blow by occurred at a lower temperature. But they didn't want to hear that. And so I got the same looks as Arnie, and I went back to my seat also. As they continued their discussion, just before they took the vote poll, the vice, pre the vice president, senior vice president and general manager 
turned to the vice president of engineering and said, it, said to him, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. Real subtle threat, huh? Well, vice president of engineering capitulated, unfortunately. They took the vote poll shortly thereafter. It was four votes to launch. The presidential commission asked them why they didn't poll us. And the general manager said, we already knew the position of the engineers and it was fruitless to poll them because we knew we would not be unanimous. Now, see, that's what they're supposed to do. And if anybody is not unanimous, that's a default to a no launch. But yet we weren't given the opportunity. They went back on the telephone conversation, told NASA that, and they read from this list that they had generated, told NASA that they wanted the launch, that this was the new decision. There was very little questioning, no probing discussion. NASA promptly accepted the decision. Telephone, uh, telecon was basically terminated. And I was very angry when I left that room, believe you. If I had had a box of grenades that evening, Thiokol would have been leveled. <clears throat> this is the decision-making chart that they actually based their decision on. Now, you ask yourself, as I go down these statements one at a time, if these are actual statements that support a decision to launch. The calculations show that SRM 25 O-rings will be 20 degrees colder than SRM-15. This is the Challenger. Challenger will be 25 degree, 20 degrees colder excuse me, than the January 85 O-rings. Remember the near miss. Temperature data not conclusive. There's that word again, not conclusive on predicting primary O-ring blow-by. The engineering assessment is that. That is a lie. An outright bull-faced lie. There was no engineering assessment at that caucus. The only two engineers who spoke were myself and Arnie Thompson, and we were not allowed to be engaged in discussion. And so that, that is an absolute falsehood. Colder O-rings will have increased effective durometer. In other words, they'll be harder. Do you remember that on my chart as a reason for changing the timing function and the, and the fear of launching? Harder O-rings will take longer to see. That's another way of saying timing function. But this look, makes it look like it's a positive attribute instead of a negative attribute. More gas may pass the primary O-ring before the primary seal seats. That's the magic wand trick. You had 24 successful flights and you just declare it's going to work. It's going to seat. You can't do that, people. You, we don't know what's going on inside those joints in real time. The demonstrated sealing threshold is three times greater than the 38,000 erosion experienced on a January flight. That is a true statement, but it does not apply. We were not discussing O-ring erosion that night. We were discussing if the seals would function first as seals before the hot gas ate them alive. And then we had a comfortable three factor of safety of three on margin. We had tested many subscale tests, and that was a real number. But it didn't apply that night. We were afraid that the seals wouldn't even function as seals first. If the primary seal does not seat, the secondary will magic wand trick again. I don't know how you can do that. Pressure will get to the secondary seal before the metal parts rotate. I don't know how they knew that. I it was the closest person, and Arnie was the second closest person to those joints, and we certainly didn't know that. There had never been, never been one test, dynamic test run on pressure, temperature, or deflection run on these motors. Why? Because in order to run those tests, you have to drill holes in a case. In a drill hole in a joint, you void $1 million worth of hardware for flight. That's why they didn't run a test. But I'll assure you, after the Challenger disaster, they drilled holes like you can't believe in a joint. <laughs> they took flight hardware out of the stream like it was popcorn. But yet, before the disaster, we could never get that information. The O-ring pressure leak check places the secondary seal in the output position, which minimizes sealing time. That doesn't say anything. It's just filler. That's a fact of physics. If I put pressure on one side of an O-ring, it will move to the opposite side of the groove and it will do it a thousand times out of a thousand times regardless of what the temperature is unless it's frozen solid to the deck. It doesn't say anything. It's like pushing a cable with casters. It's going to move as opposed to being grounded. It's just filler. Morton Thackel recommends that the launch proceed on the 28th. Now, d does anybody in the audience see anything after that statement? I, I sure don't. See, the CEO of Morton Thiokol, as late as the spring of 1988, said in an interview with Business Week magazine, as he was still trying to protect his corporate hindsight, that Morton Thiokol never agreed to launch at the temperature at the time of launch. And I maintain to you, oh, yes, they did, right there. 
It doesn't, there's no caveat, there's no exceptions, there's nothing on that that says they can't launch. And quite frankly, if it had dropped to 20 below zero, NASA with this chart has the, has the authority to launch. The last bullet actually contradicts the first bullet. The Challenger will not be significantly different from the January 85 launch. They had just said it would be 20 degrees colder, and we had made, I, I thought we had made a pretty good case for the increments from 100 down to 75 down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the severity and how the O-ring responded, and that it was very, very important in those increments that the lower we got, the more serious difficulty we were going to have. Well, when this, was, this chart was finished, NASA asked for a signed copy of this chart. As you can see, Joe Kilminster, who's the guy, our program manager, signed it, and it was faxed down. This is the ultimate CYA piece of paper in the program because NASA knew that they needed this signed to protect themselves. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the only temperature that anybody knew about in that program, including me, that night and up to that night, and since that night, was 40 degrees Fahrenheit, period. 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I wasn't willing to launch, neither were my colleagues, at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but that is the lowest temperature that any of us on the program even knew about. And so they did violate launch commit criteria. Al McDonald told Larry Malloy at the Kennedy Space Center he would hate to be the one that had to stand up in front of a board of inquiry and explain why he launched below the specification temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But he was ignored at that point in time also. Well, I had made up my mind not to watch the launch the next day because I was very, very afraid that what we were predicting was going to occur. But one of the colleagues that was in the room that night had a daughter at Thaikal that day who had never seen a launch, and he had another daughter that worked at Thaikal, and I knew them as family friends. And so I sat in with him as he coaxed me to come in and watch. Well, as the vehicle ignited and cleared the launch tower, I whispered to Bob that we'd just dodged a bullet because we were told by the ballisticians, the people, the engineers who are experts in how propellants burn and how they work, and from past experience that they had, they told us if we had so much as a tiny pinhole in the case, it would blow up on the pad right at ignition. Well, when that didn't happen, of course, I felt, well, whew, we're home free. <clears throat> at 60 seconds into launch, he whispered back to me that he had just completed a prayer of thanks for a successful launch. 13 seconds later, we both saw the horror of destruction along with our colleagues in the room as the vehicle exploded. And there was no mistake in our minds that it had exploded because it was way premature in the separation. It should have gone 120 seconds. And as typical engineers, we all got our chronometers out every time there's a launch and we time it with a stopwatch. We always do that. And it was 73 seconds when it let go. But strangely enough, right after the explosion occurred, and I was very angry, even, even knowing this, our boosters actually flew out of the explosion, still thrusting, so it, it wasn't us but I was still mad in hell because if they had just listened and not launched, that sequence of events would not have occurred, whatever the cause at that point in time. Well, one of the managers was in that room, actually the man that said nothing that night except shook his head yes to vote, to launch. He went out of that room like he was shot out of a cannon because I think he realized what serious trouble the program was in at that point in time because of what had transpired the evening before. Well, Annie Thompson and myself were actually placed on a failure investigation team in prompt order and sent to the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And what I saw there shocked me and actually made me very, very angry and disgusted. NASA management at the center was diligently attempting to find a condition other than low temperature that caused the disaster. I think they knew the seriousness of what they had done, and they were trying to actually pin this disaster in something else. They had actually closed out photographs of the assembly, and, and they claimed that there was a twisted O-ring. And I swore up and down to them that I had just tried a piece of O-ring and twisted it, actually put it on, put it on the desk uh, and it had about a, a yard length of it with secretarial whiteout tape and twisted it full 360 degrees three times. And I left it on my desk, and it unfoiled, and the whiteout tape was in a line, which says that the stored energy in O-ring was sufficient to avoid a twist in it. And that was just on a desktop. Imagine how it would act in a greased, on a greased surface. It would even be dip more difficult. I argued with them and argued with them and argued with them that that couldn't possibly happen. And what they were seeing was a track that somebody had caused by just wiping, inadvertently wiping the surface with a glove or a hand. They actually sent a team of experts out to Thaikal and spent two weeks trying to 
take a photograph of a twisted O-ring in a joint. Of course, they couldn't do it. After two weeks, they came back and said, well, I guess you were right. Well, even more important than that, we are on the failure investigation team. We never showed this information for a week to 10 days later. They had actually known within 24 hours of launch what actually caused the disaster. But those on the failure investigation team were never made privy to it. They had 16 millimeter film of it. You see this arrow right here? That points to this black smoke. This is the aft joint right here. See the black smoke coming out of the aft joint? This is right at ignition. This is at 0.68 seconds. There's a slight delay because there was partially, there may have been some frozen water in the joint and it delayed it slightly. But that's pretty close to at the beginning of ignition if you take in that delay time. They knew that and they had never told us who were on the failure investigation team as they chased us down blind alley after blind alley after blind alley. Well, after Al McDonald had made the Presidential Commission aware that the telecon took place, they scheduled a, the Presidential Commission scheduled a closed door hearing at the Kennedy Space Center on the 14th of February, 1986. We were instructed by the company attorneys to go to that meeting and answer all questions, yes or no, and volunteer nothing. Can you imagine how much information they would have really found out if we had done that? Well, I, do, I wasn't willing to do that. And I bear it all, I was, pardon me, the first to testify. Arnie was second, and he basically verified everything I said and added a few words himself. Then Al McDonald gave his version as he was at the Kennedy Space Center that night. What the commission members heard was so shocking to them that they asked us to all leave, close the door, placed a call directly to President Reagan, and informed him of what had happened. They were so afraid that because of what they had just heard would never, ever last to the end of the day before the press got it, that they didn't want the president broadsided, and so they made the call. One of the aides to the commission told us this. Well, five days later, I was being interviewed by another commission member, and I handed a packet of my activity reports and memos to him as in an answer to one of his questions, and the company attorney present literally almost fell off his chair. I realized at that point in time that I had truly not endeared myself with company management <laughs> because my memos actually stopped their testimony cold in its tracks and clearly proved that this problem had been around way before that telecon meeting, and I had the documented evidence that I had handed over to him to prove it. And so from that point on, management had a very, very difficult time in testifying with a series of half-truths. And from that point on, the focus of the investigation was not only on the technical failure of the joint, but on the manage managerial failure of the organization. On February 25th, we got to tell our, our story in public, and I fell into further disfavor by directly rebutting our general manager's testimony just before me, where he claimed that the engineering position at the telecom meeting that evening was not unanimous, and that was simply not true. Everybody in the room that evening was there for the sole and specific purpose of stopping the launch, even the general manager, believe it or not. He anticipated that it would be a highly politicized or potentially politicized uh, uh, problem but he knew what we were striving for before the meeting even started. So if he didn't support it, he sure as hell didn't voice, voice his opinion against anything. And so the default is that everybody that was in that room that remained silent was there for the sole purpose of supporting the launch. That's why they were there in all actuality. Well, after my testimony, I was off the failure investigation team, immediately sent back to Utah. And at, while I was being told in March that I was a major participant in the redesign, I was felt very strange because I was, it seemed like I was being isolated from the program. I was given technical input but never invited to meetings, never knew when they occurred, never knew who attended. I was told by the grapevine that my technical input was changed from time to time and I had no input essentially. I was essentially being isolated. It took me about six weeks in real time to really understand that this was happening. Well, in May, Al McDonald and I would call back to the Presidential Commission. We were asked point blank about our job assignments. And when I answered the, the question with the fact that I was being isolated from the program and that Al answered that he had 30 people that were reporting to him originally, now were not reporting to him anymore and he was now reporting to one of them, the Presidential Commission got very, very angry because they said we were being punished for honesty in our testimony. Well, the company took a lot of flack about this because the Presidential Commission actually released the closed-door hearings and made it public. <laughs> 
And Thakal got beat up very severely in the press by the press, the Presidential Commission, and the Congress of the United States. It got so bad that our colleagues at the plant were now blaming us for all of Thakal's problems. We started to refer to ourselves as the five lepers. There were five of us that testified in one degree or another, and we were being ostracized by our colleagues. We tried to uh, cause a mitigation of the internal strife by asking for a meeting with the CEO, the president of the aerospace division, and the person heading the shuttle program at that time because uh, the program was actually coming down around their ears and it was out of control because the original people who were controlling the program and made the decision to launch were still controlling the program, if you can believe that. They were still in their position. The meeting, unfortunately, was one-sided, totally one-sided. We bared our souls to try and help the program and the company and we were basically ostracized, and it, the CEO made it sound like that if everything worked out okay, all would be forgiven. And that was basically the tone of the meeting that, that took place that night. Well, in June, we were all called back once again, and this time to testify in front of the uh, presidential, not the presidential, but the House, Science, House Committee on Science and Technology. When we went back there, it was really an a bad experience for me, extremely bad experience for me. During two days of intensive preparations with attorneys and PR people, I, and we in general, but I specifically, were the victims of an attempted PR people brainwashing. As they told us that the Congress of the United States, the people on this committee, were only interested in press coverage and they really didn't give a damn about Challenger. How do you think, you know, that made somebody like me feel? It was very distressing because they tried to influence my testimony directly, but they failed once again. And I answered all the questions the best of my ability. But it took its toll on me. When I went back to Thigh Hall, I could no longer endure the hostile day-to-day -day environment. And so by July, I went to a company executive, explained the situation. He said, you better take some time off and get your head cleared. When I did that, I went out on a medical uh, leave, got some professional help, got a diagnosis, well, not diagnosis at that time, but I, I got some professional help to the, to the degree and the point where I knew that the source of my problem was the company. And I called them up in September and told them I would never return to work for them. They told me to continue on leave that I had to go and get diagnosed by a psychiatrist, which I did. I was officially diagnosed by one psychiatrist, one psychiatrist and three psychologists as having post-traumatic stress disorder. I received long-term disability through my medical program, which started in January of 87. The day I qualified was the day I got my final notice that I was terminated. I was received my final check, and they asked me to send my badges in. I did that. I received 60% of my former salary for two years, and then everything was down to zero. Now, what this really leads to is everyone's professional responsibility. And I believe it is best explained in this timeless piece by Mr. Adolph J. Ackerman. He wrote in the, AS, he wrote in the IEEE uh, uh, publication that in 1967 that engineers have a responsibility that goes far beyond the building of machines and systems. We cannot leave it to the technical illiterates or even to literate and overloaded technical administrators to decide what is safe and for the public good. We must tell what we know, first through normal administrative channels, but when these fails, through whatever avenues we can find. Many claim that it is disloyal to protest. Sometimes the penalty, disapproval, loss of status, even vilification can be severe. Today we need more critical pronouncements and public declarations by engineering, engineers in high professional responsibilities. In some instances, such criticism must be severe if we are to properly serve mankind and preserve our freedom. Hence, it is of the utmost importance that we maintain our freedom of communication in the engineering profession and to the public. The decades ahead are bound to be a critical and difficult period, and there will be occasions for sharp dissent and strong words if we are to meet our responsibilities. Close quote. I simply recommend practicing the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Unfortunately, business in this country especially is, has perverted that golden rule, and it's called do unto others before they do unto you. Now, 
Don't be expected to protect, be protected if you are not willing to protect others from shoddy professionalism. Speaking out may or may not extract a price for doing so, but I can assure you of one thing. You will have a clear conscience and a peaceful sleep at night for doing the right thing. Academia research on whistleblowers provides us some insight. Actually, the industrial government complex strongly discourages whistleblowing. If a whistleblower goes outside his organizational culture, he is usually severely punished for doing so. To send a strong message for others in the organization not to do the same or else they will receive the same end result. Industry and government have succeeded very cleverly in deceiving the public about the character and motives of whistleblowers. The general perception is that whistleblowers are troublemakers and snitches and try to make trouble for their employer while exactly the opposite is the truth. Extensive research shows that those who step forward with bad news do so to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public and their companies. But whistleblowers are most often long-term dedicated employees whose only concern is to right or wrong within an organization to prevent somebody from a high probability injury or death. And it's really that simple. But industry and government has distorted the truth so well that winning vindication for a whistleblower is all but impossible. I'd like to just quickly summarize, just so you have a feel for what happens to people, the methods used to neutralize a whistleblower. Make the whistleblower instead of the message the issue. Isolate the whistleblower. Set the whistleblower up for fall. Display maximum toughness in selecting charges against the whistleblower. Eliminate the whistleblower's job. Destabilize the whistleblower's support base. The following are some of the methods to neutralize the dissent itself. Overwhelm the whistleblower by making him or her struggle for self-preservation of career, family, bank account, and even sanity until the point of dissent is put behind weighty, weightier survival priorities. Separate expertise from authority. Keep the employees ignorant about what's going on. Substitute democracy for scientific methods for decision-making. And last, but I believe one of the most important ones, is to prevent a written record. When a policy is indefensible, the goal is to restrict debate to an oral dialogue. Since it is difficult to accuse somebody of revising an oral dialogue, and accountability will be diffused in the event of a tragedy. I have to tell you, each of the foregoing categories were used against me and my colleagues at various points in times, all except dismissal. The Congress of the United States and the media made it virtually impossible for Thai Call to dismiss us. But they did make our lives absolutely miserable on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the bottom line in this whole thing and, and, and why it's so important is accountability. And there's been no accountability to date, even today, no accountability. The Morton Thiokol employees, unfortunately, will be the ones that have accountability extracted from them. At this point in time, there have been over 1,000 employees laid off at the facility at Morton Thiokol out of about 8,000 people. And that's very, very severe. In northern Utah, there are no other jobs to go to. And so some of these people, unfortunately, actually have to walk away from their homes. The lack of accountability has actually produced an incredibly lousy nozzle joint redesign that they're flying today. The joint actually begs failure by Murphy's Law once again, just as the original joint that I showed you. Now I have some suggested solutions. I, re I suggest that we require the passage of the EIT exam as a prerequisite for obtaining an engineering degree. Now don't all moan and groan. I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't already done, only I did it the hard way. I took the EIT being out of school over 30 years. So it can be done. And then take the, the, EI, the uh, PE exam and pass it and get licensed. Now, the reason I, ask, I, I suggest this is because you can use the code of ethics as a very effective club when a manager comes up to you and asks you to do something unethical. You can simply refer him to the code of ethics and ask him, is he asking you to violate this code of ethics? Do you see the effectiveness that this potentially could have? I, I believe it would really work and put the decision-making process back in the hands of the engineering and the technical people. And it would also avoid the current shameful paradox that exists in this country at the present time. Really, the only people that need to be licensed are civil engineers who build our roads, bridges, and buildings. Most of the others of us have a huge industrial exemption and not need to be licensed. But consider the paradox. What does more harm to you as an individual? The roadbed that you drive a car over or the car that you're riding in? Did you ever think about the airplanes you fly in? I did the stress analysis on some of that stuff. I'm not licensed. Wasn't licensed at the time. Does that give you a warm feeling? It doesn't give me a very warm feeling. And it's a terrible paradox when you really look at it 
as, as to what it represents. The huge industrial exemption actually provides a, a huge resource pool of a renewable resource of engineers, and that's why it's done. And it's a way to, to promote cheap labor in an overturning uh, business community. Well, my hope is that attorneys can make inroads into the, into the law and cause the transfer of the engineering code of ethics to management and restore the technical decision making to the technical people. But if this fails, I feel that the long-term solution really rests with univers university education. And it rests with them to teach students the benefits of combining science, technology, and society issues towards the upgrading of ethical decision making within industry and government. In conclusion, I will never forget, and I hope this nation will never forget, especially the engineering community, the supreme sacrifice that the seven challenger astronauts made for forfeiting their lives for such an irresponsible launch decision. May we always remember astronauts Scobie, Smith, McNair, Onizuka, Resnick, Jarvis, and McAuliffe for their dedication and courage to this nation's space program. I implore all of you not to dwell on any of the negative aspects that you've just heard, but use those conditions that you've heard as a positive lesson on how to recognize and act upon confrontational situations that you may encounter in your careers. And I assure you, you will encounter them, albeit in a much lesser visible environment. I hope we can all learn together from past organizational misconduct and bring about change toward practicing the golden rule in business and government to significantly reduce unethical decision-making practices. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, yes. Sir, that was a marvelous presentation. But I want to ask you, why do you think that universities are the proper place to teach ethics? Do you think that the ethical standards of universities are sufficiently high or uh, different from the general community? If, if I want to be a whistleblower, I'll stand up at that desk. What I can say about universities would be just about the same as what you have said. So I don't believe that the ambient uh, at the university is very ethical. It's just hidden a little more. No, but you have to understand that, that, that the real uh, effect of an engineering education is to become socially inept. We are technically sharp, but socially inept as hell. And if you don't give people the rudimentary basics on what to expect, then you're expecting them to respond to situations that they've never been schooled or even have an inkling of, of, uh, of being thrown into the lion's den. And I believe that through a case study such as that I presented here, that there are many fruitful areas of discussion not that you will make everybody an ethical person, but you will give them the basic tools to make an informed decision. But you know? how do you uh, expect people who are no more ethical than others to lead ethical discussions? I, you teach things all the time. Uh, in, in a, things, in, things we know about engineering and well, so forth. <laughs> well, you use this... No ethics. How do we know ethics? We are the teachers and we don't know ethics. Are you telling me that you can't take what I just gave you today and use it as a videotape presentation as a segment of your class and actually motivate people towards a, a understanding of what they need to expect when they get into industry, whether you're unethical or not? If you can't do that, then you don't have a very good rapport with your students. I don't think professors have very good rapports with their students. We have some students here and they can tell us how good rapports they have with their professors. Well. Well, I'll tell you, I've been at many of the major universities around this country, and the student bodies are the ones that are actually asking for these courses to be taught so that they do not go out with blinders on. And if the universities can't respond to that, then we are in a sad state of affairs in this country. Other, other questions? Uh, I, I had uh, a point I wanted to clear up. When you said that, that the engineering group on this meeting the night before, before the management reversed itself, the engineering uh, uh, participants were unanimous in recommending that the launch not take place, and that this information, not uh, this recommendation not to launch, had been transmitted to decision makers within NASA. Is that correct? That's correct. So they were clearly appraised of the fact 
that the technical people had recommended not to launch. That's right. <laughs> and that uh, they then, when they received the other in recommendation, knew that it was not based on the same technical. Um, no. It was not a repetition, but was simply a management appraisal of the gamble. No, no, you miss you missed the sequence of events. What we did that day was we, as engineers, convinced our own in-house people not to launch, and we had the technical rationale to support that. When we were finished convincing our own in-house people about that, we had informal discussions with NASA and Marshall Space Flight Center. We had no view graphs, but we had informal discussions and expressed and verbalized our concerns. And when they heard our concerns verbalized, they became very antsy about what we were talking about, and they asked us to formalize our concerns in a formal presentation on a telecon that evening, which we did with a formal hookup between three, two centers and us at, at the plant. We actually gave our engineering presentation, and the expectation never wavered from the fact that we were there for the sole purpose of stopping the launch, as was the initial result. What happened that night is we ran into a buzzsaw with a customer, namely NASA, who actually reversed their posture. And, and, and instead of forcing us to prove that it was safe to launch, which was a normal occurrence, they were actually put us in a posture to prove that it was not safe to launch, and of course we couldn't do that. All I could speak in is terms of probabilities of failure, and no numbers, mind you, because I had no numbers. But I have two eyes, and I had 20 years, 27 years' experience, and a good feel for what these little babies do. And everybody else knew about it in, from an engineering standpoint, too, and they listened. You see, we were successful. What we, what we actually ran into that night was a totally unexpected customer reaction. Yeah, but that seems to me yeah. to, to exonerate Thiokol that if that they had made possible a vehicle for communicating the concern of the technical people. Your voice had had a hearing, and your colleagues had had a hearing, and your customers chose to ignore the technical information and recommendation they were receiving from the technical people. And it seems to me that, that your uh, company people should have been thoroughly protected by that chance. No, for no not at all, because they actually ultimately capitulated as managers and, and gave permission to launch. Yeah, and but what that, they doesn't, that doesn't take away from the oh, fact no. that that information had been given. Oh, yes, it does, because what it did was it, what it did was it showed that the people who ran the company were now coming up and saying, you remember that chart I showed you? It implied, it implied that there was an engineering review that took place. See, the implication was that the engineering assessment is that. It implied that the engineers participated in that caucus, when in fact that was not true. And so they actually had deceived NASA on the receiving end of this information as to what happened. See, we were on mute. They couldn't hear us and we couldn't hear them. This was a closed hearing, a closed meeting. And so they did and they do deserve, as, as manufact designers and manufacturers and producers of this booster, I assigned 75% of the blame for the launch on Thiokol people. Now, that you may, that you may sound, think that that's harsh, but damn it, it's their hardware and they have a fiduciary responsibility to, to justify that the, or that, to give the uh, information that their hardware is ready for launch. And when they say that their hardware is ready for launch, by gosh, it should be ready for launch without any crap shoot or gamble in pressing that button. And so they should be held and put their feet to the fire, about 75% of the blame. Now, if you internalize that same type of percentage within Morton Fire Call, I say that the general manager of our plant should be accorded 75% of the blame because he's the one that created the ultimate internal pressure in that caucus when he, and he finalized that with his direction to the uh, vice president of engineering to, to play ball. And so I apportioned 75% of the blame for that launch decision on the general manager in, in, in that plant. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but the fact is they cannot dodge the responsibility for making this decision. I thought at that night, and I still think it today at this point in time, that the reason they did what they did is that we were in negotiations for a follow-on sole source contract without any competition that would keep them making boosters into the late 1990s without any competition whatsoever. Yeah, but don't you think the NASA representatives knew that pressure that was on them and that they, they had a very clear idea of what the technical problems were?
and they use this uh, reversal of, of position of your thigh column managers simply to do what they wanted to do in the first place. Oh, I think that's correct, and I think that actually is underlined by the fact that they didn't ask any deep or probing questions during, during the receipt of that answer. And I actually had a presidential commission member who will remain nameless tell me that, Roger, it didn't make any difference what you guys did that night. NASA was going to launch anyways, period. And so our guys would have come out way ahead if they had just hung up the telephone conversation. What I'm trying to do is put it at the feet of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that. But I can make just, uh, and, and, and I agree, there's great circumstantial evidence for that, for that position. But there's just as strong an evidence on the other side of that coin for NASA creating their own pressure. Oh, this I was NASA's premier PR opportunity since landing a man on the moon. Think about that. Now, after that disaster, NASA went through a major reorganization uh, and uh, change of management. Uh, do you think uh, any of this would be prevented by the uh, change of management and styles that are now? Well, the flaw the the in that statement is major. They did not go through a major reorganization. They went through a cosmetic reorganization, which means absolutely nothing. The, the motivation for cost and schedule is alive and well, people. It's alive and well, and, and, and you don't have to take my word for it. Just go back and read the newspapers since they returned to flight. NASA rolled out the return to flight vehicle on the 4th of July. Ra, ra, ra. They no sooner got it out to the pad when they developed major fuel leaks, which they acknowledged in a press, in a press release that they never, ever have fixed on a pad. They always roll back into the vehicle assembly building and then proceeded to fix it on the pad. There are, there are literally hundreds of examples since the return to flight like this that will absolutely conclusively prove to you that the organization is still badly broken. Over 10 scientific astronauts have resigned from the program. Why, I ask you, would scientific astronauts, all PhDs, all very talented individuals, all who worked their fingers to the bone to get into the astronaut core program, why would they give up the premier technical opportunity of this century if there still wasn't something really bad in the program and they were see, seeing themselves use the sacrificial lambs once again. Why would Sally Ride quit shortly after she issued her report? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense at all unless the system is still screwed up. I had numerous phone calls, both with inside of NASA and with inside of Morton Fire Call, and the message was loud and clear. Roger, it is business as usual. NASA set up a, a snitch program, an internal snitch program, that, would re that people would remain anonymous, and it goes through the Columbus NASA facility. The first person that re reported a very severe problem, and it had to do with the O-rings. Uh, somebody had actually slit the O-rings, I guess, with a razor blade, and they were hoping to draw attention to, to problems in the manufacture of the O-ring seal. It was a hell of a way to do it, but, but that's what they did. Do you know that the first test case through this supposedly anonymous system, they identified the individual? What do you think that did to the system? It totally diffused the system as being operative. Do you think that things have changed at NASA? I just came from the NASA Goddard Space Center last week. I got the ultimate invite to talk to my colleagues at NASA at a different center, of course, but the fact of the matter is they're scared to death about this upcoming launch after I talked to them about this, this incredibly lousy joint redesign. You know, let, let me show you. You want, you want to see? You want ammunition? I'll give you ammunition. <laughs> this is the redesigned joint that I have no problem with, technically. I don't like it as the best design, but I have no problem safety-wise. You can recognize the original configuration of the joint in here. See the crosshatch section? That's the new additional piece that's now machined as part of the tang. And this purpose is a capture feature to keep this leg from lifting off. This is now an interference fit right here. Okay? These parts are supposed to be used 19 times. You, you, you really think they're going to get 19 uses out of these things after this interference fit is galled and chewed up every time they assemble this thing? I don't think so. But as far as its O-rings, and they love O-rings, they added another O-ring. It's a Viton O-ring. But this seal will always remain compressed and always get more compression as the vehicle is pressurized. So from that standpoint, it's not bad. And which way is that going to buckle when, when, it, when the whole thing is pressurized? When this, all these go out. This tries to go in, but it can't anymore because this won't let it. And as this mutual interface moves, it just causes this 
L-ring to stay compressed. Now, see, I had recommended a wire mesh uh, elastomeric impregnated seal for this position that is used in the oil industry. It can withstand 35,000 PSI and 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for a long period of time, way in excess of two minutes. And they put a Viton O-ring seal in there. You know, I, I'm really ashamed to admit that I told them how to make this joint. They, they had this coming down originally right here, and they could not figure out how to get a machining quill in there to machine the slot. And like a stupid jerk, I told them they just had to relieve this and they could have machined it, or else they would have had to come up with a different design. But I have no problem with this from a safety standpoint, no problem at all. Uh, it's a belt and suspenders. They also have heaters on the joint to keep them nice and toasty warm. Okay, this is the joint I really have a problem with. This is a joint that I believe that none of you as engineering students or engineering professors would even design in your home workshop. This is an abortion. What we have here, and you recognize the joint, the nozzle fixed housing, this is the aft dome. They've got a little bit different character of insulation. They have what they call a split flap, which allows the stress to be taken off this, this opening. They have adhesive in here, and they have another O-ring. There's the level of O-rings again right there. But this is not used as a seal. I'll explain that in a minute. There's the original primary seal, the original secondary seal, and now they've drilled 100 radio holes between the original primary and secondary seal, installed 100 bolts, and underneath the head of these bolts, they put the magic seals called stato seals. They are washers, and you guessed it, O-rings on the ID. That's <coughs> a blind assembly, people. By its very name, stat means static, stat o seal. This piece relative to this piece moves in the axial direction, roughly eight to ten thousandths of an inch. This piece moves relative to this piece some amount unknown in the circumferential plane. Because when these assemble, they're not round. I assure you they are round when they're pressurized to 1,000 PSI. And so you have relative motion. This joint is designed to have a gap. It's designed to have a gap. Who in their right mind would actually clamp against an airspace, against a gap that was designed, a piece of equipment that was designed to have a gap in it? What it means is that at 100 discrete points, you have metal-to-metal -metal contact. And in between the 100 discrete points, you have a daisy effect with a gap. In between the bolts, it will act very similar, not in, in magnitude, but very similar in technique of deflection as the previous joint. Now, remember, we had already gotten past a primary O-ring seal in April 1985 flight. This is not a test. It was a real flight. If we ever get past the primary seal again, we now present 101 potential leak paths instead of one that we had originally. I had also proposed a metal seal here, which would have not only taken the temperature, but would have been impervious to erosion should we ever get past. My recommendation for this joint was to simply take these aft domes, put them up on a vertical turret lathe, cut a cylindrical true surface, extend this. They had to make all these new pieces anyways here. Extend this out and put a register that would actually keep this piece from moving in and out like it had done before. It would minimize it. Okay, now get back to the adhesive. I, I submit to you that if you had gone around and taken a poll with Thiokol and asked, is anybody ever concerned with hot gas getting past this adhesive? The answer, including me, would have been not on your life. It'll never get past the adhesive. Hot gas can never even get to this first seal. This is considered a wiper seal. And the purpose of this is to keep this adhesive from following the real seal during assembly. Now let me ask you a question. If the purpose of this seal is to keep that adhesive from following that seal during assembly, does not it follow that that adhesive will follow this seal during assembly? Guess what happened? The first two development tests of this joint, a hot gas test and a cold gas test, they got gas right through here past the adhesive. One gentleman told me that it stopped here, and the other gentleman told me it went all the way up to the primary seal. Two out of two test failures in the redesign of this joint and this joint still went forward and is flying today. Now, do you think something has changed at the agency? I sure as hell don't think something has changed at the agency. This is the type of crap that they still put out. This is a Murphy Law type joint. This is the joint why, this, this joint is why I don't watch launches anymore. I am absolutely afraid to watch a launch because of the fear of failure in real time again. I could probably see a videotape, but 
not in real time. That was too much to go through that one time, and I won't do it again. But this is what we're faced in the program today. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, there's opportunity to uh, talk to Mr. Beaujolais again in the refreshments in Old Double E building, and uh, I thank you again. Uh, I think we all appreciated your presentation very much. Thank you.